one second. Father, I thank you today, Jesus. Thank you so much for tonight, Lord. Thank you for everybody that made it on here, Lord, made the effort to be on tonight's Bible study, Lord. I just thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, Father. Just every day you let us live, God. I just, every morning, Lord, and every day I just think about it. So many people, it was their last day to live today, but you let us live today. <laughs> yesterday, you let us live yesterday. And Lord willing, you'll let us live tomorrow, Father. Every day that you allow us to be alive, Father, it's just such a blessing that we were constantly after a blessing and asking God to bless us. And when is my blessing going to come? But every day, someone's somebody would wish that their blessing would come in the form of another day of life. God, forgive us when we're ungrateful. Forgive us, Father, when we overlook our blessings and we think we're not blessed or we're waiting on a blessing, Father, when... Every day that we live, Father, it is a blessing. It goes to show that you're not done with us. You're not finished with us. That we still have a purpose here, Father. I just, I thank you for that, Father. I thank you so much for that. And I thank you today, God, because if you're, let us live and you're allowing us to be on this Bible study is to draw us closer to you and to be like you. I pray that you would bless everyone that's on here tonight with this Bible study as we're studying your word. Reveal the meanings of your word, Lord. Father God, to to know your word without it revealed, Father God, it's just it don't go, it doesn't go anywhere, Lord. So we pray for your divine revelation and understanding and wisdom that we need, Lord, not only to comprehend your word, but to apply it into our lives daily, Lord. That let every verse that we read here, Lord, let it stay in our memory, let it stay engraved in our heart. Lord, that way we never forget your word and that we can meditate on your word, Lord. In my Jesus' mighty name, I thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen, God. So, guys, we're going to continue our study on the book of John. Amen. As you guys remember what we were studying, we studied chapter 1 and chapter 2. And when we're done with the book of John, I'm going to quiz you guys. I'm going to quiz you guys. I wasn't going to tell you guys, but I'm going to quiz you guys on if you remembered what was taught on the book of John. And maybe there will be a prize for the winner <laughs> on who gets the most things right on the book of John. And you might say, well, I'm going to just study the book of John. Well, you, you got to pay attention to what's taught on here as well. Amen. So we studied uh, <clears throat> chapter one and chapter two. So now we're going to study chapter three and chapter four for, you know, those who are your first time on here. We're studying the Gospels. You know, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every Gospel um, is a different account or different perspective of uh, uh, that person who had an encounter with Christ. Matthew was a tax collector, so he gives his account on his encounter with Christ from his perspective. Luke gives it from his perspective. Uh, everyone gave it from their perspective, and John gave it from his perspective which we all know he had a closer relationship with Jesus than the other disciples. That is why John calls himself the one whom Jesus loved. He calls himself the beloved <laughs> disciple, you know, just a reminder. Jesus didn't call him his favorite. <laughs> John was saying that about himself. You know, I, I was looking at some stuff online. People were like, yeah, he was Jesus' favorite disciple. Was it? Jesus doesn't have favorites, but he definitely had a, a more in, um a deeper, you know, intimate relationship with him. Amen. So with that being said, guys, we're going to continue on chapter three of the book of John. So make sure you have your Bible, your highlighter, take notes. It's good stuff. Amen. And if you have any questions regarding what we're talking, you could just write it in the chat. Hey, I have a question about this verse. Um, that, uh, let's keep it on topic. You know, if we're studying, don't say, Hey, Jamie, but what about the dinosaurs? Let's try to keep it on topic. Amen. All right. So chap uh, John chapter three, verse one, uh, the new birth. It says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. We, we, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one could do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Anybody know why Nicodemus was coming to him at night? 
why Nicodemus the Pharisee was coming to Jesus by night? Anybody know? Anybody want to take a good guess? Because he didn't want anyone else to know, uh, to see him. Amen. Did you know that or because of the show, The Chosen? <laughs> the show. Totally the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, amen. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was trying to get to Jesus secretly. He was trying to have a secret relationship with Jesus, right? He didn't want to get caught talking to Jesus by daytime because what was going to happen? The criticism he was going to get from the other religious people, the other Pharisees would have went after him if he would have been approaching Jesus and talking to Jesus, um, you know, publicly amen so this was going on <clears throat> this was going on and um and and what could we grab from this don't be a nicodemus nicodemus wanted to have a relationship with christ privately your relationship with christ cannot be private amen your intimacy that you have and stuff with god yes those things are private but your relationship with God needs to be public. Amen. It has to be public. Nicodemus wanted to have a private one because he didn't want no one saying anything about him. He didn't anyone ridiculing him and criticizing and judgmental about him. So he wanted to keep it on the down low. Your relationship with God cannot be on the down low. See, a lot, there's a lot of people that want to, that want to have private relationships with Jesus. Don't want to talk about Jesus on their Facebook, their Instagram. Um, most people don't even know they're Christian. <laughs> you know, you got to ask yourself tonight, does everybody that knows you know you're a Christian? Do they know that you love God? Do they know that you serve Jesus? Do, you, do they know that you don't do those sins that they're doing? Because if you don't, you're living like a Nicodemus. People need to know that your relationship with God is everything to you. See, that everybody that gets to know you, they say, this person loves Jesus. This person loves God. This person lives but if people don't know that, or people say, oh, he goes to church, but they don't really know that you have a relationship with Christ, you have become a Nicodemus. Amen? You don't want to be a Nicodemus that you're you're trying to uh, have this private thing with God. And there's even people that are Nicodemuses with you that they'll privately ask for prayer and privately you know, ask for godly advice and stuff, but never, ever want to go to church, never, ever want to look. You only want the private benefits of knowing Christians or knowing Christ. Don't be a Nicodemus. Amen. So he recognizes, right, that Jesus, only God can do this, right? But Jesus answered him, most surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, um, so Jesus makes it clear, you cannot be saved. Salvation is a huge thing, right? People say, oh, what do you do to be saved? How do you know you're going to heaven, right? This will be the number one way that you know you are saved. This is the number one way you know that if you died right now, you're going to heaven is that you are born again. You can say you believe in Jesus. You can pray to Jesus. You can go to church. You can have the cool Christian bumper sticker on your car. But if you are not born again, you are not saved. You're not saved. Isn't that crazy? You have to be born again. What is it to be born again when the old you dies and you no longer are making a practice out of sin in your life that the old you die you don't do those sins no more that you were doing in the world and you became a new creation in christ if you are still at the club if you're still being a liar if you're still fornicating if you're still being an adulterer if you're still drunk if you're still listening to worldly music if you're still doing all these sins and you you're still making a practice out of it you are not born again the bible says he who makes a practice out of sin does not know god <clears throat> why because when you know god 
you live for God. How many could say amen? When you know Jesus, then you that means you know everything about him, his expectations, his word, his commandments, the benefits of living for him and serving him. Why would you not live for him? <laughs> you know, I think about it every day. God, you saved me. You rescued me. How could I not live for you? And I was thinking about it this morning. So many people died today and they went to either hell or heaven. And, you know, more than likely a majority of people go to hell because the Bible says narrow is the way to heaven and broad is the way to hell. So that means there'll be more people in hell than there'd be in heaven. So a majority of people go to hell. And if they would give anything to have another chance of life, even if it was for 10 minutes, just just to get their life right with God and enter into heaven. And, you know, it's so important. It says here, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So it doesn't say whoever confesses Jesus and prays to Jesus, unless he is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, this is, I'm probably going to stay on this verse for a little bit. Have you noticed that when you go to church, they'll say, is anyone here never accepted Christ Jesus, right? The big churches normally do this. Anyone and two or three people raise their hand, come forward. They, this church will never do an altar call. But all of a sudden they'll tell these two or three people come forward. Just repeat this prayer after me and you'll be saved. And the question is, are they really saved after that prayer? There's only one way to know what happened to that person's life after they made that prayer. See, we'll, we'll declare them saved, but how do you know they were born again? That's why discipleship and following up of someone is so important. You can make a public confession or you can make a confession, but did you live a life for God? See, Nicodemus didn't want to make a pub. Come on, man. Nicodemus did not want to make a public confession of who Christ was. He wanted to have it privately with no encounter, true encounter with God. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, if you deny me in front of man, I will deny you before my father. What does it mean to deny God before people? that you don't tell people who Jesus is to you, that no one knows you're a Christian. You don't talk about Jesus. Man, I know so many Christians. They never post Christ on their Facebook or their Instagram. They'll post their business, what they eat, their dates, their vacations, but don't post nothing about Jesus. How are you so in love with Jesus, but you don't post about him? So G Jesus says, if you deny me before man, I would deny you before my father. That's some scary stuff. So Nicodemus, quote unquote, is technically denying him because he doesn't want to do it publicly. He wants to do it privately. And Jesus is telling him, unless you're born again, because when you're born again, you don't care about going public with God. You want to, you want to let everybody know about God. Haven't you noticed that everyone who encountered Jesus in the Bible, they went to tell everyone the whole town would know what Jesus did in their life. Isn't that crazy? The whole town would be such and such person is saying that Jesus healed them, set them free. When you have an encounter with Christ, you tell everybody about it. I don't understand a Christian that can't tell no one about Christ. I, to me, you didn't have a real encounter with God. How is it that nothing inside of you is not saying go share everything that God did? Imagine that you're going to die from cancer. God heals you and you don't tell the world about it. That's crazy. So Jesus saying, unless you're born again, you cannot, you will not see the kingdom of God. That means you're not saved. Another thing. So we talked about the little prayer thing at church and the Lord was revealing to me this as we were studying, as I was studying this, what about the people who die or dying or whatever? And they accepted Christ at the last couple seconds or minutes of their life. We'll say, oh, that person is saved. But they didn't get a chance to be born again because their life was cut short. How do you know they're saved? Well, this this we won't know, but Christ knows. And I was praying and I said, Lord, like, what about the person that didn't get a chance to live their life to prove that they were born again? And the Lord told me, I will weigh their words. 
that if they weren't going to die, that that prayer that they made in that moment, that if they would have continued to live, if they were really going to be born again after. See, some people will make that prayer in the last moments of their deathbed, but if they were given the chance to continue to live, they probably wouldn't have been born again because they had the chance to live. So they weren't really serious about what they were praying. They just wanted to make sure they didn't go to hell. And the Lord was like, told me, I will weigh their words that if their words were going means that they were going to be born again, if they were given the chance to live, whether they lived or died, that they were going to be born again after then yes, they would they would be saved, even if they weren't given the chance to live their life. I will weigh their words that if in that moment they said that and they meant it, and even if that meant that I let them live, they were still going to be born again. Yes, they will see the kingdom of God because God weighs the hearts. <laughs> you ever heard that? God weighs the hearts. But if that person said that, oh, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, and, and you know, in that moment, but let's say God gave them a second chance and they weren't going to do it. That prayer meant nothing. <laughs> you want to know why that prayer meant nothing? Because the Bible says my people please me with their lips, but their heart is far from it. The, 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 oh, but Jamie, what about the thief on the cross that in the last minute, do you notice he never made the prayer of salvation? At the cross, did you know he never said, I'm sorry? Did you know he never said any of the things? Why? Because his heart, God weighed his heart. He didn't say the religious prayer that they tell you to say. You want to know why? Because in his words, it said everything. He said, he told the other one, hey, man, we deserve to be on this cross, man, and deserve that. He goes, but Jesus, when when you're in your, your paradise, remember us. Those words alone are recognized. It's him recognizing I'm too dirty and sinful to be in your kingdom. But you remember, so they were acknowledging who they were and acknowledging who God was, which is a sign of repentance. And that's why he was able to enter. That's why Jesus told him, you will be with me in paradise because God weighed his heart. And some people think they'll wait their whole life. Oh, I'll live my life. Have you ever met someone? Oh, yeah, but on my on my deathbed and my last minute of living, I'll just say, God, forgive me of my sins and, you know, and I'll enter into the kingdom. You think God doesn't have your little game and system figured out? <laughs> you know, one time I was about to get into an accident. Right. And I thought like, yo, my life is about to flash before my eyes. I'm going to die. And and you know what my last words was? Oh, crap. <laughs> and that would have been my last words. <laughs> I was about to get into a car accident, and I'm telling you, God, I literally saw my life flash before my eyes. And the, the my last was, oh, crap. <laughs> Who, what makes you think that on your last seconds of you dying, you're going to say, oh, Jesus Christ, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins, Lord. And you're, You think you're going to do that? So people who live a life that, oh, on the last second or last minute of my life or whatever, I'm just, I get a chance to repent. It's not that easy. <laughs> think about it. You have every day to live. You have, let's say, 24 hours today. And some of you guys have 24 hours today, and you're still not living right with God. Oh, you have 24 hours today. You're still living a lie. You have 24 hours today. You're still living in sin. You have 24 hours today. You're still fornicating. You're 24 hours today. God has given you and allowed you to live. You're still lying. You're still all these different things. But in a couple of seconds, you're going to get it together. God is going to weigh your heart. God is going to weigh your heart of your words. Oof. Has anyone ever heard this like this before? <laughs> Josh will call it the famous loophole. Yes, it, but it's not a loophole. It's a loophole to hell. <laughs> it's not a loophole to heaven. It's a loophole to hell. Isn't that crazy that this verse alone, we're not taught this correctly. We are not taught this correctly in the church. Because according to everyone, everyone's in heaven. <laughs> every funeral, everyone is in heaven. I always thought, man, don't you ever invite me to talk at someone's funeral that I don't know. Amen. Let's continue reading. Anybody learning? Anybody learning anything? It's quiet in the chats. <laughs> it got real quiet. <laughs> Anybody learning anything from this? See, we 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 don't have a true understanding. We don't have a true understanding of what it means to be saved. You must be born again. 
Guys, if you're on here tonight, please, please say at the end of this chat, I am not born again and I need to be born again. Because if you're still living the same life you always have, yet you go to church, you pray, you read your Bible, but you're still living the same sinful life, you are not saved. And tomorrow is not promised. Get right with Jesus. You know what's so crazy? I have the Holy Spirit. I pastor a church and I still every day get right with Jesus. And every day I make sure <laughs> just in case. <laughs> Amen. So everybody should. So let's continue. Verse four, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? Has anyone ever felt like, man, because of my age and how many years I've wasted, how could God do anything in my life? <laughs> Nicodemus had that mindset. How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Once again, Jesus is giving another Thing to let you know how is it that you get into heaven because everybody wants to know how do you get into heaven everyone thinks you just say jesus is my lord and my savior and you know i saw this video very disturbing video on my instagram it was a church right and the, la the pastor was a lady and they're repeating this prayer it was the most disturbing demonic disgusting thing i've ever heard in my life they said let's church let us pray we believe that Jesus Christ and they were like, is a binary God. We believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, but he wore dresses and tunics. And you guys know where I'm going with this, right? Does everybody know where I'm going with that? So I don't have to elaborate on what they were saying. If you know where I'm going with, with, with what they were saying, right? Amen. So I know not to have to keep saying what they were preaching or saying. So. They were saying that, and I said, how could you say the name of Jesus in such a disrespectful way? How could you pray to Jesus and 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 say he's non-binary and this and that, and he wore dresses and and that and they were saying that how God is this and that, and he was okay with all this, you know, confusion nonsense agenda that's being taught. So is saying the name of Jesus enough? Is it? What do you guys believe? Do you believe saying the name of Jesus is enough? Yes or no? No. Because they're saying that in their prayer. They're saying Jesus is Lord in their prayer. But yet they're saying Jesus is non-binary and all this stuff. And God's non-binary and, and all this stuff. No. Saying Jesus is not enough. When we when the, these churches come forward and say Jesus and make this prayer, you're saved. It's not enough. Jesus didn't say when Nicodemus is asking, how do you get saved? He didn't say, just come forward and say, this just just make this prayer. Did Jesus say that? Did Jesus say, just come forward and make this prayer with me real quick? Did Jesus say that? Yes or no? Did he say that to Nicodemus? Oh, come forward and just raise your hand while everyone has their eyes closed. That's another thing. <laughs> the Nicodemus effect that has gone on in, in the church. Everybody in this church, keep your eyes closed. Raise your hand if you've never accepted Christ. Because isn't that crazy how stupid that is of the church? Everyone should have their eyes open so they can see that you made a de you made a public de come on that you made a public declaration that you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He is going to be God of your life and that you can be held accountable now that everyone in the church has seen that you've made that decision. Now we can stay on your butt to make sure that you live a life according to His Word. But everyone keep their eyes closed so nobody knows that you accepted Christ? Has anyone been to a church that you've seen that happen before? Everyone keep their eyes closed. Right in every, so that way, but raise your hand if you've never accepted Christ because they don't want no one to know or see you that you accepted Christ. It's crazy. But see, there, so Nicodemus is asking, what do I got to do to be saved? First, he says, you got to be born again. So that's already clear. You're not going to heaven if you are not born again. Born again means the old you died and a new creation happened in Christ. You cannot be in Christ. You can pray to Jesus, go to church and say whatever it is you want to do, right? Kind of said, I've seen the eyes closed when they say who needs to reconcile. Even then, what do you need to close your eyes for? 
everyone needs to should know and re celebrate because oh you're embarrassed to get reconciled with god why would you be embarrassed but see that's the nicodemus mindset let me go to him at night where no one can see that i'm trying to get right with you no man no that's why here at unity church we we don't care we don't we don't we, we break that narrative in the church i don't care if you're coughing up, spitting up demons and crying and your makeup is coming off your face, as long as you're getting right with Christ and you're getting a touch of God, that who cares, all right? So you need to be born again. So Jesus makes it clear, you got to be born again. The next thing he says, you got to be born of water and the spirit. Two baptisms. It says, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, meaning water baptism, and the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit baptizing you and the Holy Spirit coming to dwell inside of you, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. How come nobody says that at church when they tell them to come forward? You need these two things if you want, if you want to get saved. Because when you have an encounter with Christ, you want to live for him. So you're going to start doing all these things for him, right? And it says here, that which is born of the flesh is the flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is the spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So everyone, so is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? <laughs> so Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you teach all the Israelites, you teach the word of God, but yet you don't even know this? He said, most assuredly I say to you, we speak that we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earlier earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. Isn't this, this scripture, guys, you need to memorize this. He who believes in him is not condemned. Guys, if you believe in Jesus, keyword believe, believing, if you believe in God, that means you serve God. If you say you believe in God, but you don't serve God, then you really don't, you really don't believe. Because if you believed in who he is and what he is and what he can do to you, you would be serving him, right? So if you believe him and you serve him, guys, you're not condemned. So many Christians, and I dealt with it for a while, we live a condemned life. You're not condemned to hell. Stop living a life in constant worry if you're going to hell. If you are in Christ, you believe in Christ, and you're living for Christ, guys, heaven is secure for you. And, I, and I, as I'm saying this, I feel like it's giving uh, some of you guys this weight is coming off your shoulders because some of you guys live this life almost worried that hell is waiting for you. It is not waiting for you. Heaven has been secured for you forever. What a peace that people don't have no idea where they're going, but because you made a decision to believe in Jesus and I'm going to serve and live Jesus. Guys, you are not condemned. You are been rescued. You have been saved. You are forever <laughs> secured your place with Jesus in heaven. What a beautiful thing to know, right? You don't have to live in this constant fear of being condemned, not being good enough, being garbage, and that Jesus is mad at you and Jesus doesn't love you. That's the condemnation spirit. Don't listen to that spirit. God doesn't condemn you. I heard even someone say, yeah, like when the Holy Spirit talks to you after you sinned, that's not. That's a, you, The Holy Spirit talks to you before you sin, not after you sin. Because after you did it, it's too late. You already did it. 
It's always the devil that talks to you after you've sinned because he's the one telling you, you see, you did it again. You see, you really don't love God. You said you weren't going to do this again. You did it. That's the voice of condemnation. The Holy Spirit is the one talking to you beforehand, telling you, don't do this. But a lot of us, we live with a, a spirit of condemnation. And here, this should give you peace that he says here, he who believes in him is not condemned. You are not condemned. And it says, but he who does not believe, <laughs> this is the bad news. He who does not believe is condemned already. <laughs> so those who don't believe in Christ, you don't have to worry about condemnation. You're already condemned. And it says, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. What a scary thing, right? And it says here, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So how is it that a person is condemned to hell, right? You want to know how a person goes to hell? Because they didn't believe. What's the reason they didn't believe? Because they love darkness rather than light. How do you know you're condemned to hell? This is how, guys, you'll know tonight if you're going to hell. One, do you believe? Oh, yes, pastor, I believe in Jesus, all right? Do you love darkness rather than light? What does that mean? Do you love that one sin that you know you should stop doing more than God? If there's a sin in your life that you love more than God, that you will not stop, then that means you're loving darkness more than light. Mm, I know that you, some of you guys are like, man, I need to get right. And, and look, tonight's the perfect night. Get right with Jesus. It says here, he makes it very clear. Is this Jamie's words? By the way, guys, is this Jamie's words or is this the words of Jesus? I'm just I'm just asking for a friend. Of, is what I'm saying the words of Jesus or, or are these Jamie's words? Can anybody answer that question? I'm just asking for a friend. It says here, this is the condemnation, right? So how are you condemned? Right there. When you're loving you're loving sinful things more than God. When you're loving sex more than God. When you're loving drinking more than God. When you're, lo you're loving lying more than God. When you're loving living a secret life more than God. When you love cheating on your spouse more than God. When you're loving any of those things that you don't want to stop doing, you're showing that you love darkness rather than light. And if you have any of that, you better make sure that you do it and get it right. It says, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. <laughs> but he who does does the, it, you know, some people say, Jamie, you preach, you preach hard, you preach tough. Is it really what I'm preaching, or is it what the vibe was, or is this what Jesus said? I'm asking this question, Jamie. You're preaching a very hard message. Is very, you know, where's the love of Christ? Am I preaching my own words? Or am I saying what Jesus is saying? I just want to make this clear because I've had a couple of people, <laughs> believe it or not, come tell me that I preach too hard, that I, I preach in a very condemning way, or that I, I should take take it down a notch. But guys, I've had people say that to me. Am I saying something that Jesus didn't say? I, if you have your Bible and you're following me, it, it's 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 in it's in red letters. <laughs> On my iPad in the Bible, it's in red letters. Those are the very words of Jesus. <laughs> Just like Fermi said, red prints. So how is it that this message is not said? Isn't that crazy? We, we These are Jesus' words, but yet you do not hear the church talk about this at all. They only tell you the pretty stuff, right? So John the Baptist exalts Christ. Verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing and Aeneon and Salem, um, Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Why? Because John was got there before Jesus. He was preaching before Jesus did, and he had disciples before Jesus had disciples. And it says here, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So look at that. <laughs> John's disciples trying to cause drama 
hey, the guy you baptized is now down there and everyone's following him and they're not following you no more. Isn't that crazy? That same toxic comparison stuff still happens amongst the disciples, the followers of Christ in today's church. Hey, the guy you imagine that that's like <laughs> I baptized Furman and Furman starts the church and everyone follows him. Hey, like, look, they're all following him and not following you. This that nasty comparison in the in, in the in the church. Who cares? They're following God, regardless who they follow. They need to follow Christ. So it doesn't matter if they follow him, they follow someone else. They follow the Joshua, Freddy, who it doesn't as long as they're following Christ. But look, look at the humility of John. <laughs> John said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So it's crazy. We talk about other people of God. Oh, the, the way they cast out demons, discernment, speak tongues. You better be careful what you say about that person, because it says here, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Amen. So it says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been set before him. He who was the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Guys, if we're going to follow Jesus, he must increase in our life. And the only way Christ increases in our life is if we decrease amen you want more of god in your life then more of you needs to be out of your life <laughs> i want you want more of christ in your marriage then it needs to be less of you in the marriage you want more of christ in your finances then your there needs to be less of you in those finances the more christ increases you must decrease if you do not decrease God cannot increase in your life. I know so many people, God, I want God to bring increase in my life, but you are not willing to decrease. You must decrease. You got to lower yourself. Amen? So you'll be like, God, I want more of you. I want you to do this. If you're not willing to decrease yourself, he is not going to increase in your life. And John had an understanding of this. He said, he who comes from above is above all and who he who is of earth is earthy and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard and what he testifies, no one receives his testimony. He who has received this testimony has certified that God is true. Jason said, would that be called selfless? You have to be selfless with God. You have to be. It's all about God. Everything that you do in order for God to increase in your life, you, everything about you needs to be for God and about God. If it's about you. See, a lot of people want God to increase them, but don't want to get themselves out of the picture. God, I want you to grow in my marriage, but I want my marriage this way. God, I want you to give me a child, but it has to be this way. God, I want you to give me this job and finance his career, but it has to be this way. No, you got to be, you got to decrease. God is your way. God is how you want it to be. God, it's you first. God, I got this money. It's you first. Some people will get money and the first thing they do is save it and spend it on something else, but they won't, they won't give it to God. Those are selfish people. The minute you get something, you need to be thinking, God, how, how can I honor you with this? How can I bless you with this? God, how can I do it? Those are the ones who God gives much to. And it says here, um, and he who has seen and heard has testified. No, uh, okay, okay, it says here. So if, what does it say? So if to more being self-centered is being wrong, yes, being self-centered is wrong. And what he has seen it says here, and heard that he testified no one's received his testimony. He who has received this testimony, testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does uh, not give the spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Okay, just making sure I heard it correctly. I'm multitasking. Yeah, being self-centered is wrong and sinful. You know why? Because the Bible says where there is self-seeking, you will find all kinds of evil there. So anyone who's self-seeking is self-centered. If you're a self-centered person, you're an evil person by the by according to the standards of God. And it says here, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Yeesh. See, we all say he who believes has everlasting life, but they don't read part two that if you don't believe, believe it, like I said, if as we just read, if you believe, it's not just saying I believe or John 3.16 tattoo on you. 
Believing means believing and serving, born again, born of spirit, born of water. Those are all the things that go into believing. <laughs> because even the demons believe, right? And it says, he who believes, so, and, but if not, it says the wrath of God is awaiting for you. What a scary thing that you're like, man, I, you know, you got Jesus and you got wrath waiting for you. But praise God. We're in Christ. There is no wrath awaiting for us. How many could say, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> because I believe in you and I serve you and I'm born again. There is no wrath waiting for me. <laughs> Those are for non-believers. That's why we pray that non-believers get saved so they don't experience that wrath of God. John chapter 4. Verse 1, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. You know, it's crazy. It says here in my in parenthesis, though, Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples did. <laughs> trying a sign of a good leader. He was putting his disciples to do it. He says he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sichar near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciple had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Why? Because in those days, Jews did not mix it up with Gentiles, Samaritans. There was... Borderline racism there, right? And it says here, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. <laughs> That's how some people are. If you really knew God, you would change the way you talk. Oof. See, if you really knew Christ in your life, you wouldn't talk the way you do about your life. If you really knew who Jesus was, you would change what you ask for in things in life. That's what Jesus is saying. If you really knew who I am, how you treat and live your life would be so much different. He says, oh, because if you did, I'd be giving you rivers of living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. She's crazy. She still didn't realize who she was talking to. It says, and where then, where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who gave us the well? I'm convinced that this woman was a Karen. <laughs> Her name must have been Karen. I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> it says here, are you greater than our father, Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock, questioning Jesus. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Man, he's giving her many chances. How many can say thank you, Jesus, for all the chances that God has talked to us? And we don't acknowledge on the first, the first, look how the loving patience of God, like after the first time, if I was Jesus, I would have said, you didn't realize what I just said, deuces, but look at the patience of God, giving her multiple chances to see who he was. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And she didn't even say, give me this Jesus or this God that you're talking about. She only wanted the water. <laughs> Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. <laughs> Guys, I love, this is probably one of my most, I love this part of the Bible. And it's hilarious because people think they know Jesus. This is why we're reading this verse by verse. Because people think that Jesus, all he did was stay quiet, never say nothing. He didn't make any kind of remarks to offend. And isn't that crazy that people say, oh, you shouldn't be offending people with the Bible. You shouldn't be offending stuff, right? Let's see if that Jesus you're saying that doesn't offend no one, if he is that. Let's see what he says. He says, go call your husband and come here. 
The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. Does anyone get like get what he's saying here to her? People say, oh, you, oh, you shouldn't be offending people the way you share Jesus or you say this or that. But look what he just said. Go get your husband. She's like, I don't have a husband. Oh, that's right. You got five husbands. And the guy you're with right now, he's not your husband. You're living with another man and he's not your husband. What was he saying in other words? I think we could all, you know, in our today's language, know what he was saying to her. Right? Does anybody understand that? Or you need me to elaborate on it more? <laughs> and it says the woman's. This is uh, this is hilarious. Look at it. Look at her response. The woman said to him, "Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet." <laughs> so she got she got exposed. Uh, see, we try to live a a, a fake life, a, a front that we have it all together until Jesus confronts us. In other words, he told her, "Lady, you've been around the block a couple times." Don't, don't pretend like you have it all together. You've been around. And what does she say? All, from all the things he was preaching, she didn't acknowledge until she got exposed. Oh, come on. Until she got exposed about her sin. Now she wants to say, I see that you are a prophet. <laughs> so when people say, oh, you shouldn't expose people. You shouldn't expose people in their church when they're living in sin or when they're when they're doing that. You shouldn't do that. Did Jesus do that? Did Jesus expose? When Jesus will expose you when he's been trying. Come on, somebody. Jesus will expose you when he's given you many chances to get right with him. When he's been trying to preach to you and trying to minister to you, he will give you many chances until you leave him no choice but then to expose you. So when people say, oh, you shouldn't call out somebody's sin or, or expose them. Did Jesus do it? Guys, help me out in the chat. Did Jesus do this? I need some interaction from the church to make sure you guys are understanding. Yes or no? Directly to her. <laughs> That's what I like what Connie said. Directly to her. When God gives you multiple chances to get right and get saved and you play dumb, he will eventually call you out and will expose you. He called her out. He said, you don't have go get your husband. I don't have a husband. Yeah, you've had five husbands. That's why. And the one you're with is not your husband. In other words, he called her. A, you know what? <laughs> and now she's like, I see you're a prophet. <laughs> God will do that to you. Don't be like this Samaritan woman that God has to be. Trying to get your attention, trying to get your attention to one day he has to. I'm going to expose who you are. In order to prove to you that I'm God. So when people say, oh, exposing someone or mentioning their sin and calling them out on their sin is wrong. That's God's job. Come on, man. Anyways, it says here. I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mount, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you and neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the father. You were you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship uh, the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So that religious mindset is still around there. Like people will go to the wailing walls to this day in, in, in Jerusalem, you know, in Israel, and they'll go praying and there's even people that I have to go to a church temple in order to pray. I know people that are like that. They they feel like they have to go into a church temple to go pray or to go worship. And Jesus is saying, the hour is coming where you'll neither do it on this mountain nor in Jerusalem to worship the Father. You, you've got to be able to worship Jesus everywhere you go, anywhere you go, at whatever time. That's when you do it in spirit and in truth. If the only time you worship God is on Sunday, you are not a worshiper in spirit and in truth. You must worship Jesus everywhere you go, anywhere you go. And that is the kind of people 
you know it's crazy there's not many verses that say like Jesus is search searching for a specific type of person other than this it says here but the hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking why do you think when Connie and Joshua open up the service they try to encourage you guys to praise and to worship and some of you guys look like dead people during the I, I hate to say it like that during praise and worship do you understand? And the reason why is because God is looking for people. It says here, the hour is coming. It says where the father is seeking such to worship him in spirit and in truth. Isn't that crazy? God is looking for somebody that's going to do that for him. And if you say you love him, imagine he's searching and you claim you love him. And he's searching for someone to do that for him. And he's searching and he doesn't find you doing it. Isn't that sad? Like the the heart of God, man. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't talk about enough about is about the heart of God. God's like, man, I'm looking for somebody, you know, to love me and worship me, and, and you know, in spirit and the truth. And here we are in church, and He does not find that in you, man. Ask God, say, Lord, help me to become a worshiper in spirit and in truth. Amen. And it says, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? All that. And then this is where the, the, the Muslims, just like her, thinking Jesus is, is a prophet, still does not recognize that Jesus is God. So people say, oh, Jesus never said he was God. Well, you can show it right here. John 4, 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So anytime anyone says Jesus never said he's God. When she when she said he was a prophet, he didn't wreck. He didn't acknowledge that comment because he wasn't. He is God. And it says here, I who speak to you am he. Amen. It's good to highlight that verse because when you ever try to preach to Christ, to other people that say, oh, Jesus never said he was him. That verse is right there. He he did definitely said it. Verse 27. Everybody enjoying this? Everybody learning? Verse 27. And the reason why I'm telling you to highlight those parts, guys, I've evangelized for many years, and people know their Bible well. They just don't have a revelation, true revelation of it. So they're going to question you. And if you don't have, you don't know these things, they're going to take you to school on the streets. Mark my words. Go knock on doors and you will be taken to school by someone if you don't know your Bible. And they'll even make you question your faith. <laughs> know your Bible. 27, it says, and at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? It says here, the woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? <laughs> So I said, when you have an encounter with Christ, man, you tell everyone about it. How can you stay quiet? This woman just got called to you know what. And because of that, she's now going to tell everybody, yo, there's a man who told me all the things that I ever did. <laughs> Crazy, right? And that's and you know what? That same power is inside of you. That same power. Why? Because. If you're born again, some people ask me, Jamie, how is it that you pray for people and you know things and that? It's not me. It's the God in me that does it. And that same God lives inside of you. The only way that God, that same God does not live inside of you is if you're not born again. But if you're born again, that same God is in you. And that's how you have word of knowledge. That is a gift of the spirit. Word of knowledge. You'll know things about people. <laughs> You'll know things about people. Amen. And it says here. Um, could this be the Christ? They went out to the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. <laughs> Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look into the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps, um, so heck, so fruit fly. 
receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying is true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. What is God saying here? Jesus is saying God has allowed you to reap benefits and blessings in your life that you did not sow for. What a blessing. What is he saying? The labor that Christ did, you reaped the harvest of it. What a beautiful, amazing thing. Imagine that somebody worked the night shift for you and you collected the check and the extra night shift bonus. <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus worked the shift for you and you collected the check. What a blessing it is to know Jesus and live for Jesus. He says, you've entered into someone else's labor and because of it, you reaped where you have not labored. How many could say thank you, Jesus, for that? Verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him and we know that he is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. Verse 43. Now, after the two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. What does that mean? Guys, sometimes when people, the people around you, they don't want to recognize who you are. And Jesus is saying that, that a prophet has no honor in his own country because people think they know you. Right. They think they have you figured out. Have you noticed that? And it's still true today. I can prophesy and say things to you guys. Maybe you won't listen because ah, I know Jamie. He's our pastor. He knows us. We'll have an invited preacher from a complete different place of the world come to church and preach on Sunday, tell you the same thing, and and you'll be crying. And, oh, damn, Jesus just spoke to me. And, and I told you the same thing months ago, but you won't listen because you're not a prophet in your own land, in your own country. And Jesus is saying that. Don't be that. Don't be one of those people, man. That you're waiting for some invited preacher to tell you something. Isn't that crazy? We go wait for some. We want it to be a stranger to tell us something about ourselves. Don't be that person. And it's here. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received them. Having seen all things, he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they did, for they also had gone to the feast. Verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs, wonders, you will by no means believe. So Jesus was getting mad. Like, you, why do you guys only believe when I when I have to give you a sign? Right. Why do I have to give you a sign for you to believe the woman at the well? He said all these things preached to her. She didn't listen until he had to call her out and know things about her for her to believe. This guy, same thing. He wants to see a sign in order to believe. But what does the, the noble man said? It says, noble man said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. Have you noticed that it wasn't just Jesus spoke it and it happened? He had to believe the word. Sometimes we, we know the word of God and we're waiting God to do certain things to heal us, heal us of our sicknesses, save our sons, our children, and change our situation. And I feel like there's people on here, you're having a lot of family issues and issues with your children. And you know the word of God, but it says here, you need to believe it. It says, so the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. Guys, you need to believe the word that Jesus has spoken in your life. You need to believe. Jesus can speak the word and say it, but you need to believe it. And say, so the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. And, it, and, it says, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. It says, your son lives. We're almost done. We're almost done. And it says, then he inquired of them when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. 
I, I like this part because sometimes we put Jesus in a box, right? When we believe, uh, he, that's why I don't, have you ever seen preachers when they'll pray for healing on somebody? They'll make them check their stuff right there on the altar and stuff like that. And sometimes they're not better right there on the spot. I don't do that. You want to know why? Because look what it says here. It says here, as he was now going down, his servants man told him, your son lives. Then he inquired of them um, the hour when he got better. And it says, it said to him yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left them. So they're letting you know it takes time. Sometimes it might take some time. Amen. And it, says, and it didn't say the minute or the second right after the hour. So there's a there, healing also comes in the form of recovery. And I think that's a lot of things we don't talk about. Sometimes your healing comes in the form of recovering. It doesn't always have. I'm not saying that God doesn't do it instantly because he can. Clearly he can. But sometimes healing comes in the form of recovery. Because if God speaks a word and it doesn't happen instantly like you think, if you really have faith, you're going to stay true to it as you recover. Right here, because look at look at this word it says here. It says yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that if it was, his father knew that it, it was at the same hour within Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed in his whole in his whole household. This again is the second sign that Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. So look, look how God works. Amen. Amen. You guys want to keep going? You guys want to do another chapter? Try to run through it quick. Yes or no? Let's take a majority, majority vote. We'll do one more chapter and then we'll pray. You guys, man, there's a fruit fly in here that keeps flying. All right, let's do one more chapter. Praise God. If y'all would have been like, no, I'd be like, dang, man, I'm a boring preacher. <laughs> Amen. All right, we'll go to verse five. A man healed at the pool of Bethesda. Verse 1, after there, there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. By the way, they just discovered it recently in Israel. So anyone that says the Bible's myth and, and stories are not real, they just discovered that pool and uh, recently. And like, is they're getting it ready for people to start viewing it. So this was a real place. And it says here, um, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Keyword, when I was studying this and I, I was looking at other perspectives of other theologians, so they believed that it was a demon. When Sometimes when the Bible says angel, it could also mean a demon because it was a form of witchcraft and people were treating this as a form of witchcraft. That's why there's people who are into witchcraft and santeria and they'll use water. Oh, you need to, have you noticed, they'll tell you you need to do a cleanse and go into the beach and go clean yourself and go and take a shower or this and that and cleanse yourself and wear white. Well, people were doing this in Jesus' days. And it says, they, uh, uh, it was stirred the water, then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Isn't that crazy? This guy was in this condition for a very long time, 38 years. The sick man answered to him, which real quick, however long your condition has been, 38 years less, that means nothing to God. How many could say amen? You might have been broke 38 years, divorced for 38 years, single 38 years, uh, 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 living, living wrong, foul 38 years. It doesn't mean anything the minute you encounter Christ. How many could say amen? It doesn't matter how long you've been in bad conditions. All you need is one moment. In Jesus. And it's because okay, so what does he say? Do you want to be made well? 
The sick man answered to him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another man steps down before me. That is what we do. The reason why some of us are in a bad condition or in sin for so many years, we make excuses. Oh, I don't have someone to help me. Oh, they don't let me sing. Oh, they don't let me preach at church. Oh, the pastor doesn't let me do my calling. Oh, the you know, oh, you know, at work they 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 chose that person and not me. Oh, if I, my my legs were stronger, I could do this. And uh, we make a million excuses, right, of why we're we're not where we want to be, guys. When we're in Christ, there's no room for excuses. We serve a living God, who through Him we can do all things. Amen. And He says here. <laughs> I don't have nobody to help me, to take me down to the steps. It's crazy. Jesus, did, Jesus didn't even acknowledge his excuse. He said, rise up and take your bed and walk. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Jesus, Jesus didn't even acknowledge his excuse. He says, rise up, take your bed and walk. You know, in other words, I'm sure Jesus said, get up and get out of here. And it says, and immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. His excuses got isn't that crazy? Jesus didn't want to hear his excuses. And it says, and that day was the Sabbath. What? The Sabbath? You're not allowed to do those things. According to religious law, you can't be doing those kind of things. And it says here, the Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered and said to him, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said that to you? Take up your bed and walk. But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. God, when, when Guys, when God heals you and God sets you free and he touches your life, you need to make sure you sin no more. Because this is what Jesus said. You've been made well. Sin no more. Or a worse thing is going to come upon you. Guys, if God has healed you from a sickness and it doesn't get you more on fire for God, something worse will come your way. And this is what Jesus is saying. Something worse will come upon you. If God sets you free of demons, sets you free of an addiction, and you choose to go back to that sin, Jesus is saying something worse will come upon you if you don't stop. This is a warning. And I feel like this is this is this should touch some of you guys. If God's made you well, He's saying here, sin no more, lest a worse thing will come upon you. So when that worst thing comes upon you, don't go getting mad at God. He warned you. And it says the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered to him, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And Jesus answered and said to him, more sincerely, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the fathers do for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things and he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. It's the same. Guys, it's the same way. Jesus is saying, whatever I do, I see the God, God, the father do. That's why we're Christians. Whatever we see Jesus do, we must do. Right. When you say you're a child of God, whatever you see him do, whatever you see in him say, you need to do it. I have people say, oh, um, I've seen, some, I've seen someone say being a Christian means to try to be like Jesus, but don't be Jesus. So that's the st stupidest thing I've ever heard. You need to try to do what he did. You need to try to say what he said. You need to be like him. Amen. You need to try to be like Christ. When you're, when you're, you're a child, you try to be like your parent. My son, it's funny. As soon as I gave up boxing, I don't watch boxing. My son is obsessed with boxing. I'll put boxing on and he literally does this like little bounce thing that the boxers do. He'll he'll do it and he he'll watch it more than cartoons. He doesn't want to watch cartoons. <laughs> He's because he sees that's what I do. So because he sees that's what I do, I I have videos on my phone. I'll show it to you guys. If I start, if I start, if I start throwing punches, he goes crazy laughing. <laughs> and, my, and my wife will testify. But whatever he sees the father do, he wants to do. 
We need to be the same way with God. Whatever we see, our God, what Jesus did, our Father in heaven, we need to replicate that. Amen? It says, for the Father raises the dead, gives, the, gives life to them. Even so, the Son gives to him who he wills. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Meaning, guys, you cannot have God in your life if you don't have Jesus. There's people who say, I believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus. Then you don't have God in your life. Verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Amen. So all those who pass away in Christ don't they don't go to death they go to life it says more shortly i say to you the hour is coming now when the dead will hear the voice of the son of god and those who hear will live for as the father has life in himself so he has granted the son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the father who sent me. So there will be a resurrection of the dead. That's what Jesus is saying that those who live for him will enter into eternal glory with Jesus. And those will enter into eternal condemnation. Verse 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who wears witness, wears, uh, bears witness of me. And I know that, that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John. So God, he's basically saying John had to come and to say who I am. Because if I say that about myself, no one's going to believe me. <laughs> it has to be out of someone else's mouth. And there's a crazy, there's a verse in the book of Proverbs, it says, let someone else praise you and not of your own lips. Don't tell people how great of a person of God and this and that you are. Let it come from someone else's lips. So John had to come and say it. That's why there's people who will say, that's what say you really got to know the Bible. Because in Islam and Muslims, they'll say Jesus never explicitly said, I am God. And that he says it here. Why he doesn't explicitly say it like that. He says, "There it says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that that witness which he witnesses of me is true. So anyone that ever tells you, oh, Jesus never expli explicitly said he is God, he tells you exactly why he didn't say in those exact terms. He said that John had to say it. And what did John say? That God was coming in the flesh and he was preparing the way for it. So Jesus is God. It says, yet I do not re re receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness that than John's for the work which the father has given to me to finish the very works that I do bear witness of me that the father has sent me and the father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him, you do not believe. You searched, look, at, I highlighted this verse. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they that which testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Ooh, once again. Jesus preaching the hard stuff. He says, you search the scriptures for in them. You think you have eternal life. So people who think they're so smart, people think who they know all the scriptures in the world. He says, and in these which testify me, but you're not willing to come to me that you have life. There's people who know the scriptures, know the Bible, but yet they don't come to God. <laughs> and it says here, I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I've come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in my own name, him you will receive. How can you believe he, uh, who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the father. There is no, there is one who accuses you, 
Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus is telling these Pharisees, when Moses was around and you seen everything he did, all the signs, and you guys didn't believe him then, why would you believe not believe me? So guys, what can we learn from this? If Jesus is saying, man, I, I said and I preached and I did and no one believed, so you should not expect anything different. Have you not tried to preach to somebody, tell people about Jesus and they don't believe? Don't get upset. Don't get discouraged because Jesus himself is saying here, they didn't accept me. They didn't accept Moses. That's why as Christians, you can't live for people's acceptance. If you live for people's acceptance, you'll die from their rejection. You, you can't live to be, listen, when you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ. You can't be living a life trying to be accepted by everyone and be liked by everyone. Yeah, don't live for no one's validation either. You only need God to validate you. Amen. If you live for people's acceptance, you will die from their rejection. You don't need anyone to accept you as long as Christ has already accepted you. And Jesus is letting them know. You guys are not accepting me, and you guys did not accept Moses. So because you didn't accept Moses, I'm not expecting you to accept me. So what can we learn? If they're not accepting Jesus, then you shouldn't be expecting everyone to accept you because if you have Christ in you, more than likely they're going to do you like they did Jesus. How many could say amen to that? That's why as Christians, you can't be trying to get liked by everyone, accepted by everyone. Not everyone's going to accept you. Not everyone's going to like you. Because they didn't like and accept Jesus. They looked for many opportunities to kill him before he was crucified. Did you know that? there was They, they were constantly looking for opportunities to kill him. There's people who will be in your life constantly looking for opportunities to kill you and destroy you. There's people who are constantly looking to destroy you at work, in your family, on somewhere. And you shouldn't be, oh, God, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why can't this happen to anyone else? Rejoice that you could say, Jesus, I'm sharing in the same thing you suffered. And Bible says to rejoice. It says for you, if you will share in the suffering of the glory of God, you will also share in his sufferings. So I, and I feel like this will minister to some of you guys. Stop crying about all these people who come after you, getting frustrated about how they talk about you and come after you and they won't accept you and don't like you. You should rejoice about that because you can say, I'm doing something right. I'm doing something right. They're treating me like they treated Jesus. So if I'm sharing in his suffering, I'm going to share in his glory. So guys, if you're if you're if you're sharing in some kind of suffering for being the type of Christian you are at work, in your family, at home, or whatever it is that you're doing, you're suffering for Christ's sake, you better believe there's glory of God coming for you for sharing in that suffering for being like Christ. That's why we don't live for people's acceptance or for them to like us. I used to be like that. Oh, I want to go to this work and I want my boss to like me. I want my colleagues at work to like me. I don't care if you like me. I'm here to preach Christ and talk about Christ. And I know that if I do, not everyone is going to want me, like me, and they're going to treat me, talk bad about me, lie on me like they did to Jesus. And you need to rejoice because that means you're in good company. Because <laughs> Jesus said, hey, if you guys did Moses like that, I know you're going to do it to me. So what can we say? Hey, if they did Jesus like that and they did Moses and everyone else before me, then I'm in good company. Amen. We're done with that. Well, we'll end there and we'll continue on next Thursday. Amen. Did anybody learn anything? Anybody enjoy tonight's Bible study? It's very important when we see these things, guys, because it shows we learn about Jesus. Amen. We get to learn about Jesus and we see who he really is. Because there's the Jesus that people have created in their mind. Like I was saying earlier, this church that was praying, that's not the same Jesus we believe in. How many could say that that Jesus that that woman was praying to that's calling him a nine binary Jesus and this and that. Is that the same Jesus? Not the same Jesus. It's not the same God we pray to. It's not the same Jesus of the Bible. There's a lot of people who say they believe in Jesus, but it's not the Jesus of the Bible. Amen. 
people say, oh, it's just strictly on the name. I know people who have named their children Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> it's not about the name. It's the name that goes according to the word. Amen. According to the word. Like Jesus said, how can you love and know and worship something you don't know? You need to know him. Amen. Amen, guys. Hey, guys, anybody need any prayer? Anybody going through anything that you would like prayer for? Write it in the chat. I want to pray for you. Amen. I want to pray. If not, we're going to log off for you guys to be on next Sunday. Guys, if you have any tithes and offerings, anything you'd like to bless into the ministry, if my wife could be so kindly to write it in the chat. Um, it's, uh, she'll write it on there. Amen. If you have any tithes and offerings, you, my wife is about to write it in the chat. We have a cash app and a Zelle. You guys to bless the ministry. Guys, we want to eventually have our own place and our own things. That can't happen if you guys don't contribute and help. Amen. But praise God. God has always provided for us. He's sustained us. Amen. Our church ministry has been around about two years. And our church is blessed, man. Our, our little church is blessed, man. I thank Jesus for it. For all those that it's your first time on here, I see a Jesse and Rose. Guys, come to church. We welcome you to join the family. Amen. Amen. So, guys, if you have anything specific, prayer petition, you could just write it. If not, I'm just going to gonna pray. Amen. Father, I just thank you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. 